I feel that we would put him in. And um, the late, great Sherry Tippett wanted him to run for attorney general. So let's, uh, you know, let's, let's keep, you know, just uh, maybe bringing that up with Peter. Um, I'm going to let Peter run the show as he wishes. Sometimes we have questions that come up. Um, however he wants to do it, I'll just, I'm going to let him do it. I do think Peter's probably the best legislator we have. We're lucky to have him in Santa Fe, so Peter Worth. Yikes. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on a Sunday morning. Talk a little politics and kind of things going on at the national level, at the state level. I would be remiss if I didn't start by introducing my mom, Nancy Worth, who's here. I appreciate that. And typically we'd have a few more Worths here, but everyone's traveling and all over the country, but coming back. So, uh, Dorothy said uh, only one advertisement this morning. I think there's going to be two. Uh, because I just want to give a pitch again for her, what she's done here, what she continues to do against extraordinary odds. Uh, I tell you, the, the world is changing, and we're all seeing the changes. And for her to hang in and continue to run this incredible store... Uh, is something that we all need to cherish. And it only is going to happen if we support it. So I cannot stress enough how important it is for all of us at all levels to shop locally and spend your dollars here in Santa Fe. I, I was thrilled this morning trying to find a parking space. I couldn't. So we've got a lot of people in town. Uh, that's a good thing, I think. We need these tourist dollars here. I've always said our tourism and our arts really are the economic development drivers uh, of our town and so it's very easy to get focused on oil and gas and luring businesses in and we forget that what's so special here in terms of our economy. So what I thought I'd do to this morning and, and then I'm going to really uh, open this up but give, give you a sense kind of from my perspective of exactly what I've been doing uh, which is more on the, on the state level. We've got extraordinary times, both locally and nationally, in terms of our political world. And, and I think these days, more and more, we are seeing the extreme pulls uh, to either side of the political spectrum. And it's becoming harder and harder, quite frankly, to uh, have governments that really are for the people, that focus on fairness, that have members of both parties willing to sit down and do the heavy lifting which needs to happen for our democracy to work. Uh, I can tell you I've, I've had the great privilege of serving in the legislature since 2004. It has been a, a very interesting uh, process to say the least. Uh, it's something that I, I think I can fairly say I have a love-hate relationship with <laughs> because there are times when it can be absolutely sweet. You know, when you're able to run something through or you're able to stop some horrific bill, when you're able to work with one of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle to really slow something down, to stop something, to do the right thing, that's when you kind of sit there and go, this is what it's all about. Uh, there are other times, though, when it is just you kind of bang your head against the wall over and over and over again, and something that makes so much sense and doesn't seem to happen and can't quite get the traction that's there outside the institution. You know it's there outside the institution, but inside those doors there are some very, very powerful uh, interests at work. And one of the things I think I'm most proud of is being able to really work with all of you, with the constituents who I represent, with really uh, the people of the state of New Mexico to open this process up. And I cannot stress enough that it's your process, it's our process, the democratic process only works when we all engage and we all get involved. And it's very easy for all of you to sit and say, well, I'm just one person, uh, there's nothing I can do. Uh, I can assure you that is not the case. And certainly uh, at the level we're at here in New Mexico, 
one of the most exciting things, I think, is how accessible the legislature really can be. It can be very frustrating, uh, but at the same time, we're there. You can walk right onto the floor of either House, Senate, House or Senate before we start and visit with your legislator. That's an extraordinary thing that simply doesn't happen in very many places. So I cannot encourage folks enough to engage, and I think that's why you're all here, is because you care. Uh, Dorothy was referencing uh, a bill that I have worked on every year I've been in the legislature, which is a basic fairness bill, and it's something I'll talk about because I think it's critical at both the state level and the national level, and it has to do with, with our tax system and what's happened with the tax system. I think there's no place where you see the influence of the special interests more than when you dig into the tax code. And those arcane little words that get tweaked and twisted can have extraordinary consequences and impact. And so New Mexico is the last western state that allows these large multi-state corporations to work under a different tax system uh, than we have for our New Mexico uh, businesses. Uh, it's corporate tax, and it gets complicated, but corporate tax basically uh, is paid by C corporations uh, versus an S corporation, which is a pass-through company that pays income tax on your return. Many businesses, small businesses, are pass-through corporations, and they're paying the 4.9% tax that we all pay on our tax returns uh, here in New Mexico. But big corporations, the corporate tax in New Mexico is 7.6%. It's a rate that's higher than some of our sister states. And we allow these corporations to set up subsidiaries. And what they do is they set up a subsidiary in a state like Delaware or uh, Nevada where there's no corporate tax. And then they have a subsidiary here in New Mexico. And lo and behold, the New Mexico business earns a million dollars that would be taxable at 7.6%. At and that money gets expensed in an inner company transfer to the subsidiary in Delaware where there's no corporate tax. And lo and behold, you get this entity that's basically not paying its fair share. And so this is something that, that again, when I first introduced the bill, there was one lobbyist in the room, uh, Dan Najjar, who's a lawyer here in town who represents Intel. And Intel's one of the companies that's uh, certainly taken advantage of the current tax system, but they've also been willing to step up to the plate and fix it, and they've always been at the table trying to find some compromise. We've been, the first year I couldn't, you know, I barely got a vote <laughs> in the first committee, and, and slowly but surely this thing has evolved to the point where now I always like to say it's me and my 50 best friends in the nicest suits on the other side of the aisle who are there on behalf of every big corporation that's fighting this bill. Uh, what happened this past session uh, was pretty extraordinary because a coalition of advocates and a coalition of citizens and everyday business owners were fed up. And so what we were able to do is change the discussion. And rather than have the discussion in the committee room where the lobbyists basically live and fill up all the chairs and then the folks that want to come and speak up can't get in. We had so many people that wanted to participate that we had the hearing on the floor of the state senate. And what was extraordinary about it, we actually had more business people, more small business owners, more citizens there than lobbyists. And the other extraordinary thing was that the senate floor is televised. And the committee rooms are not yet televised in the state senate. And so everything was on TV. And it was very interesting to see what happens when you turn on the cameras. Uh, you know, I will tell you, having you, know, you learn every in and out of this bill and what each lobbyist says. Well, many of the lobbyists didn't get up and speak. And so it was a totally different uh, environment. And as a result, uh, what ended up at the end of the day, we did end up getting a bill up to the governor. It was narrowed down to deal with big box. And basically what it did was lower the corporate tax rate a bit for all the businesses that pay corporate tax. And then basically ask those big box competitors of Dorothy Massey and Collected Works to pay their fair share. 
and it was the first time that the Democratic leadership had supported this bill the way they did, and it went through both chambers and went up to the governor. I think it caused her to pause, at least for a minute. <laughs> she did veto it, uh, but uh, I think it sent a very important signal, and what I'd like to just share with you, and then I'll transition to the national level, what it's done, this discussion has done, is really focused on the inequity and the unfairness that exists here in New Mexico uh, in our tax code. And I think what's interesting about it, uh, even though we didn't have huge bipartisan support, we did have some Republican votes for the bill. And I can tell you that behind the scenes, there are many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that understand that we are going to have to do something here with our tax code. Because here in New Mexico, what we've done, we've been, we rely on gross receipts tax, which is probably the most regressive tax. And what we've done is we've continued to narrow and narrow and narrow the base and increase the rates, which means that it disproportionately impacts those that can least afford to pay it. And so as a result of that, uh, as these carve-outs and exemptions and deductions and the loopholes and all of that stuff has continued to get feathered into the tax code, uh, again, it was fascinating. At the beginning of the session, uh, Governor Martinez made a huge point of citing an Ernst & Young study of New Mexico's tax code that basically said we were dead last in terms of competitiveness. And, you know, I heard that and was somewhat stunned, although not completely surprised, but curious about that study. And, and here's what's interesting. It turns out that what they did is they took our tax code and they took the rates in our tax code, and they simply used those rates without looking at any of the, the billion dollars, almost a billion dollars in exemptions, deductions, and credits that exist. And if you just take the rates without all the exemptions and the dedu deductions, we are dead last. If, however, you factor in all these exemptions, deductions, and loopholes, we move up into the high 30s in terms of competitiveness. Now, what's interesting about it, think about it for a minute, what that means. To get from... 50th to 32nd, basically our rates are horrible from a business standpoint. If you put them and compare them with other states, they're high and, and the, the different calculus that's used for that. But then when you factor in all these exemptions and these deductions, you move up to the top 30s. Well, that means there are huge winners and huge losers in our system. you got people that are big companies that are skirting their obligation altogether, and we've created a system where if you don't hire that lobbyist to go get you that exemption or that deduction, you're going to be at the bottom, in the bottom level there. And, and what's scary about it is given our gross receipts tax, I think here in Santa Fe it's 8.2 maybe percent GRT, but we're down in the bottom because we're paying GRT on everything and we've created this system that's just grossly unfair. Uh, and so what's happened as a result of this whole discussion is that we now I am very encouraged that there's a group of us in the state senate, both parties, sitting down, kind of having the discussion about how we look at the tax code. How do we, how do, we do this in the Grover Norquist world? <laughs> Grover Norquist and his pledge, and I'll just transition you know, to the national scene. I think the Grover Norquist pledge is the single most, no, second most destructive thing in terms of our whole de democracy. The first is Citizens United, and we'll talk about that in a minute, <laughs> because we're seeing the direct impact of that. But basically, Grover uh, came up with this pledge that all the Republicans are pressured into signing, and Democrats are asked to sign it too, which basically says, under no circumstances will you support a tax increase. Uh, Governor Romney has signed it. Uh, Congressman Ryan has signed it. And that, in my opinion single-handedly, that decision to sign those pledges makes them unfit to serve in that position, in my, in my opinion. I, I simply feel, I can't feel, having been in the tax code <laughs> war and seeing how hard it is to do this, I just think it is completely unrealistic to think that you can't, that you can come in and approach all of the challenges that we face as a country, our deficits, etc., without having that tool on the table. There are things that need to get fixed. For example, our corporate tax needs to get fixed in New Mexico. I'm fairly certain that one of the big reasons the governor didn't sign 
that bill, which was a revenue neutral bill, we lowered the tax rate enough to bring in the resources so that it didn't raise taxes. The new money coming in was basically used to lower the rates for everyone else across the board. But I think there was fear about signing that bill and that being considered a tax increase. And so this Grover Norquist issue, I think, is absolutely important for everyone to understand and to articulate to your friends, to your family, because I just think that for those even on the other side of the aisle, that pledge is extraordinarily destruct destructive. I think that uh, Governor Bush from Florida hasn't signed the pledge. He's acknowledged that it's a destructive tool. But as we see more and more members of Congress, members of legislatures signing this because they're scared of getting primary, I just think it makes it harder and harder for our democracy to function. So I think when I go down the list of the reasons that I'm supporting the president, uh, that's one that's way up high on the list. Uh, number one, and there's so many reasons to support President Obama, I just find it hard to believe this race is even as close as it is. Uh, but number one, and let me just say, I think the single most important uh, reason is the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United, uh, which I, and we can talk a little bit about the impact, what we're seeing at all levels, uh, what we're seeing here in New Mexico as a result of that decision, but opening the floodgates, so you got all these big corporations that hire all the best lobbyists, they get all the exemptions, they build this tax code, and then what do they want to do? Status quo. Worst case scenario, status quo. So this Supreme Court decision, five to four, uh, has opened the floodgates to money in politics unlike anything we have ever seen. And I'm going to go up and down between national and state level uh, talking about that, but I, I think that the United States Supreme Court and the potential to appoint the fifth justice to the United States, States Supreme Court who can reverse that decision, that we can talk all we want about constitutional amendments and tweaks and things that might fix it outside, but the reality is the fastest way this is going to get reversed is to have that fifth vote on the United States Supreme Court. So, I, again, I think that to not have that option in the next four years is an extraordinarily scary thing for all of us. So, what's the impact? I mean, why is this such a big deal? And let me take it back down to the local level. I uh, am blessed to not have an opponent in this race, and I certainly, you know, thank all the constituents and folks out there for supporting me. And I think, you know, working hard in this community gives me that ability. I certainly appreciate all of you voting for me because I am on the ballot. I've put up a few signs, uh, but I've been what what I've been doing this year that I've never done before is working with a handful of state senators on the Democratic side to raise money to at least get in the game in terms of being able to compete against this corporate money that's showing up in New Mexico. Uh, the independent expenditure committees, as they're called, can take unlimited contributions. We finally, in 2009, I was able to carry a bill, Senator Feldman had a bill, a number of us we had been working on putting limits in place in New Mexico. It was amazing to me when I first came to the legislature that there were no campaign limits in the state of New Mexico. Unbelievable. We were one of five states with no limits at the state level. So you could give $2,500 to Senator Bingaman, you could give $25,000 to Peter Worth. That just seems crazy in a citizen legislature. We finally, after much struggle, much opposition from both sides, we're able to get that bill in place in 2009, and then along comes Citizens United. And so, uh, all of a sudden, we have individuals that are writing, that own oil and gas companies, writing $100,000 checks. We have Republican groups out of Washington writing a check for a quarter, quarter of a million dollars. And it's not just the Republican side. This is going on now on the Democratic side, too. I mean, we've got unions that are writing similar size checks to try and compete. So we've just, it's kind of a mutual escalation <laughs> that's happened. And what it means is that you see legisl state legislative races that are now having negative advertisements on television. 
Uh, I don't ever remember seeing that before. Uh, the leadership in the state senate is under direct attack from Reform New Mexico, which is a super PAC. The governor's chief political operative, Jay McCleskey, is running that. And Senator Michael Sanchez and Senator Tim Jennings are seeing close to half a million dollars come in against them. Mailers every other day. You know, if you're a constituent in Roswell or a constituent in Belen, the amount of mail showing up every day, and it's not, you know, it's not really educational in my opinion, it's, it's, it's adversarial, it's direct attack mail of the kind of most base level that you can get, and that's happened in the mailbox. We've seen that before at state races. What we're also seeing, though, is we're seeing television, you know, running television ads in, against a, a state senator. There's 42 of us. We have 50,000 uh, individuals in our legislative districts, and yet there are television ads running in the Albuquerque market that are running statewide to focus in on that very, very small little uh, group. And, that, and that, true, that is purely the result of Citizens United. And now, what it does, and this is, this is what, why I worry, what this does is it takes, the, it takes that, that tension that exists between the parties, which is a natural tension in our democratic process, but underneath that tension in the body I've been in, in the state senate the last four years, there's been an ability for us to set aside the political differences and do the right thing for the state of New Mexico. And unfortunately, as you have a number of folks coming into the legislative body who are coming in because a governor has run this type of a negative campaign to take out a sitting legislator, le legislator my worry is that those folks are going to be basically in a position where they're there because of the action taken by the executive and the ability of them to actually do something that the governor doesn't want to have happen is really going to be tough and so we've avoided that in the state senate we run only every four years and so we didn't run in the 2010 cycle which is interesting and because i think that that our body generally even though it's got a Democratic majority, what's interesting about it is of the 42 members, 28 are Democrats, 14 are Republicans, but it's run by a coalition. So the Republicans and the conservative Democrats joined together to elect Senator Jennings. And Senator Jennings has been a true hero, I think, on the, on the driver's license bill and, and on doing what he feels is the right thing to do for all New Mexicans. And so you have this interesting body where it's not just the Democrats pushing a bill forward, it's, it's groups of different members of different parties. And so as this money comes in and as you lose those members that are willing to kind of take a tough vote that wouldn't be the obvious vote, but it's the right vote that they should do, as you lose that, it just gets harder and harder to govern. And so this, I just think, is the challenge that that works its way up throughout the whole system where we have such divided government in Washington and now we're starting to see that here in New Mexico and how we get that back it just is going to be extremely difficult but Citizens United and overturning that decision I think is kind of the number one thing that needs to happen now let me say something that I am uh, you know disappointed in our president um, and that has to do with the environment and climate change I think there was an extraordinary opportunity uh, to really take proactive action. And what's tragic is to see how all of a sudden an issue that I think should not be a partisan issue, I think it's very tough to argue at this point that climate change is not happening. We're all experiencing it firsthand. But for what was a, a very bipartisan discussion, to all of a sudden become so partisan, and then, again, I, and I understand this, uh, when, when you're in a position of leadership and able to run a, a legislative agenda, you make choices. And I, and I certainly commend the president for tackling health care, which was an unbelievable undertaking, as we all know. Uh, but I do think that the challenge with respect to the environment is one that, that may not seem as urgent in the actual moment here today, but it's the one that all of our kids, grandkids, etc., 
are going to be facing, and we're all facing it. But I think that's that's something that again is going to take this bipartisan uh, effort to happen. And I don't know how we get that back on track. That I, I'm really concerned about that, uh, given given what's there. So, you know, the the I, I get lots of emails about folks upset about the electoral college and the way we elect our president. <laughs> It may be interesting, you know, come uh, nine days, there may be emails that think differently. <laughs> you know, it's that close. I mean, we're back to a 2000-type election, and we, we very well could see a situation where the president does not win the popular vote, but does win the, the Electoral College, which, of course, is the system that exists. Uh, our son, Alex, who's 19, who's voting for the first time for president, he was telling me that a number of his fellow classmates have been questioning why they should vote. They're from states where it's all one way or all the other way, and so we've been having lots of interesting discussions about that. And he's been uh, sharing his ballot with all of his classmates uh, back east and showing them all the issues in New Mexico that impact all the way up and down. I mean, this is the, the importance of voting cannot be uh, overstressed. But the other thing that's interesting is that I, I really do think, and, and Fred and Marcy and I were talking about this as we came in, I, I do think that the national vote, even though it's not the way we're electing the president, it's an extraordinarily important thing to have President Obama, assuming he makes it to the other side, win a majority of the vote, in my opinion. So, again, what I said to Alex, even if you're from a state where the Electoral College is decided, um, make sure you go push the button and send the signal because I think that that again and I'll come full circle and then open up some questions our democratic process only works when people engage I know it's extremely frustrating because there's a feeling like nothing's changing we can't impact it but here's our chance and I can tell you at all levels walking into that voting booth is an extraordinary privilege and if we all do it, then it can really make a difference. And I cannot stress enough what happens. And, and when the people speak, the legislators listen. And we've got a window, certainly now uh, in my world, where legislators are listening. And even those with whom there are issues I do not agree on, I can tell you they're listening and they need to listen because I think the frustration that exists uh, out there is something that has to get manifested into action, and that happens in the voting booth. And at the end of the day, ultimately, really, it's, it's, our, it's our call, and if we sit on the sidelines and get frustrated, and, and, you know, yes, it could have been better, it could have been different, I might like, you know, something different. I just think, though, that at the end of the day, uh, the choice that we're facing and the direction that this country is going to go is, is a monumental choice. And I just think that everyone needs to walk down and engage and push the button. So I, I will uh, happily, let's, let's have a little discussion and answer some questions and see what's on your mind. But again, I, I really appreciate the chance to come. And I just, a shout out to Sherry Tippett, uh, because she, she was the one who first had me come and speak to this group, and I just think this is an incredibly important uh, forum, an opportunity for you all to hear from a variety of different uh, policymakers and people making decisions in our community, and this is, is how we, how you and all of us engage, so I just wanted to, she's up there looking down, so thank you all very much. Any of you been following Hurricane Sandy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's driven out the national politicians. It looks like the biggest storm, literally, that's ever going to hit the East Coast now. And Obama did give a talk on climate change on MTV. I think he did it just yesterday. So I think you should check that out. It finally, you know, Mother Nature finally prevailed and got him to talk. So um, let's use the mic. When we have questions, I know it's a little weird, but I'll pass it to people with questions, and we can start um, kicking it around with Pete. I want to have one more round of applause. I think that was a superb.